Welcome to the 41st millennium. The galaxy is dark, cold, and teeming with horrors of every size around every corner. From the corrupt heretics that fill the ranks of chaos cults eager to please their dark gods, to the endless hordes of the tyrannid hive fleets, there are no shortages of problems to fix within the vast emptiness of space. And unfortunately, you get to be the unlucky bastard who has the job of squashing out the fanatical blasphemers or whatever other nasty terrors have reared their ugly heads in the Inquisition's direction. This is the grim dark of the far future and the setting of Dark Heresy. Prepare yourself, for you're either going to go down a hero of the Imperium or get dragged into the foulest crevice of the warp kicking and screaming all the way down. As you probably know already, Dark Heresy is one of several Warhammer 40k tabletop RPGs that have been released over the years, alongside other such games as Black Crusade and Rogue Trader. But while Black Crusade focuses on the insidious workings of Chaos's legions and Rogue Trader focuses on the equally evil exploits of venture capitalism, Dark Heresy instead shifts the spotlight onto the Imperial Inquisition. You play as an acolyte, a pawn in the ever-sprawling games of this terrifying faction, whose reach seems to sink into all but the most remote planets in the star system, and your job is to crush corruption wherever and however it might spring up. An ironic fate, as the Inquisition are anything but pure of corruption, but it is not your role to question them. You must be ready and willing to be at all times both the hammer that is eager to gun down a crowd of suspected cultists who would dare to defile the Gracely Emperor, and the precise scalpel who will meticulously comb a hive undercity for a refugee attempting to evade his execution for the crime of heresy. If you are up to this grueling and extremely dangerous task, then let us begin. This guide will attempt to summarize the first two chapters of Dark Heresy 2nd Edition's core rulebook and cover both the basic rules of the game and character creation, with some dabbling into other chapters as well when needed. And to keep things from getting confusing as well as to stay palatable, I'll be keeping things a little brief and not going into the finer details. Without further ado, let's press onward towards the first chapter and learn how to even play this game. Okay, before anything else we need to understand what mechanic acts as the essential cog that makes all of the other parts move. Rolling dice. But unlike, for instance, the d20 system where you roll a single dice and add a skill modifier to get things done, Dark Heresy runs on three kinds of rolls to complete most tasks in the game. The d10, the d5, and the d100. The d10 is self-explanatory, the d5 is rolled by taking however many d10 dice are required by the roll, represented by a numerical value in front of the letter d, so 3d10 or 3d5 means rolling 3d10 dice, and divide the roll values by 2 and egg them together. And the d100 roll takes 2d10s, one for the single digit and one for the tens digit and rolling them for the result, with two zeros equating to a 100. We'll be coming back to these quite a lot throughout the video, so buckle up and please pay attention. A very common occurrence during a game of Dark Heresy is the modifier. Basically, whenever a situation calls for it, a roll will be affected by either a positive or negative modifier. A positive modifier would be something like putting the barrel of your Hellfire pistol against the crown of your target's skull while they're caught unaware and pulling the trigger. A negative modifier would be something like trying to repair your ship's reactor in the middle of the dark without any lights to see what you're doing. These sorts of modifiers are applied to what are known as skill tests, and these are handled as such. Let's say you're trying to slap a computer back into working order. It's a minimal issue fix that you could probably do blindfolded, so let's say it's an ordinary difficulty rating that would give you a plus 10 modifier. That modifier, since you're using the tech use skill to get this hunk of junk into working order, would use your intelligence characteristic, we'll get to those later, to get done. And since you have a 35 intelligence, you would need to roll a 45 or lower on a d100 to succeed. Sometimes, if the blessings of the Emperor shine upon you, you will receive multiple degrees of success. The degrees of success, called DOS for short, are determined by the tens value rolled on a skill test. For example, you needed to roll a 55 or lower to convince a local warlord to give you some assistance raiding a cultist stronghold. If you rolled a 50, that's a single DOS. However, the lower you roll, the more degrees of success you'll attain. Reach the 40s, and that's a second DOS, the 30s, and that's a third, so on and so forth. Degrees of success aren't important for every skill test, but social skills in certain combat scenarios, they can be vital. However, where there is success, failure is always trailing close behind. Just how there are degrees of success as a mechanic, there are also degrees of failure. For every tens value you roll higher than the required value, that's the more you just fucked up. Though critical loss isn't as common since tens value from the target percentage is subtracted from the roll and high degrees of failure aren't as common as high degrees of success. There are also extended tests, which require multiple rolls to complete and are tests that require an extended amount of time to finish, and opposing tests. 
These are tests that only come up during combat and will require both your character and your opponent to perform a percentile roll with the victor being whoever rolled more degrees of success. Of course, you're not alone in your adventure patrolling the stars. You have your fellow acolytes to rely upon and they can provide some much needed assistance during more dangerous and harrowing tasks. With the permission from your game master, you can ask the other acolytes for help, and while only you will be performing the task at hand for every player helping you out, you will get a plus 10 modifier. That might not seem like a lot, but trust me, with the help of even one or two people, you can make all the difference. However, to balance this mechanic out, there are some restrictions. For starters, you can only get assistance from people who are trained in the skill you are currently using. Secondly, you must be adjacent to the person you're helping unless the GM says otherwise, such as giving advice on ship repair over a Vox channel. Thirdly, reactions and free actions are a no-go, period, so you can't get assistance ducking for cover. Fourth, poison and disease are also off-limits, as is anything else the GM says no on. Remember, rule zero of any TTRPG is to listen to the GM, and finally, no more than two players can help one acolyte out on a single task. This is, once again, unless overturned by the GM for something like holding a gate closed to keep out a ravenous tyranny card effects. Now that the rules are finally over, we can get onto the fun stuff and start making our character. This is the best part of any RPG, both on and off the tabletop if you ask me. And, as with all TTRPGs, this begins with jotting down your character's basic information. Their name, sex, hair and eye color, that sort of flavor text stuff. But the first real step in character creation is choosing a homeworld, and this affects numerous different factors about your character since different homeworlds are so different from one another. From the eternal foundries of a forge world to the hellish undercities of a hive world, or perhaps you weren't born on a planet at all, instead lived your youth on the deck of a spacefaring vessel. However, for the sake of this video, we'll say our character was born on a feral world, a planet that's still untouched by the corrupting influence of machinery. While the left side of each homeworld option is taken up by text describing what life on such a planet would be like and how that would shape your character, their personality, and their beliefs, on the right side is a box of mechanical benefits that you're given, and we're going to start from the top and work our way down. Starting off, your planet gives you numerous characteristic modifiers, but before I tell you what these do, I gotta explain what characteristics are in the first place. To make a long story short, they're your stats. Strength, toughness, agility, intelligence, perception, willpower, fellowship, influence, weapon skill, and ballistic skill. Characteristic modifiers affect your base stats when making your character. Stats that are unaffected by modifiers are determined by rolling 2d10 dice and adding 20 to the result. Stats that are affected by positive modifiers, in this case strength and toughness, are instead determined by rolling 3d10 and choosing the two highest values. However, any characteristic afflicted with a negative modifier, in this case influence, are instead chosen by rolling 3d10 and picking the two lowest results. Simple and easy. Next up is your fate threshold, which is the maximum amount of fate points a character can have at any one time. Basically, fate points are used to give an acolyte one of numerous different beneficial effects, like making a test easier or removing 1d5 non-critical damage. You get your fate points completely restocked at the start of each session, and they cannot be used to cheat death. To do that, you must burn fate, which will let you survive something that otherwise would have killed you, but it decreases your fate threshold by one and expunges any fate points you would have had that go over your new threshold. Increasing your lost threshold number is extremely difficult, and one of the only ways the game lets you do this is right at the very start through the Emperor's Blessing, which is a numerical value that will let you increase it by one. All you need to do is roll a d10, and if your roll result is higher than the number, then voila, you get another fate point. Since a feral homeworld's base threshold is measly 2, getting a third fate point would be incredibly easy for us, but for other homeworlds it's not such an easy feat. Now that we're done challenging our fate, we get a little bonus from our homeworld as a reward for making it this far. This takes the form of a trait, and in our case it grants us the skill, the old ways, and makes any and all low-tech weapons we use, like swords and spears, lose their primitive quality and gain the proven quality. I'll go into weapon properties whenever I get around to doing a video on combat, but in case you're curious, being a proven weapon means that when you're rolling for damage, any dice that roll lower than the listed value, i.e. proven 3, will be instead boosted to that value every time. You also gain a homeworld aptitude, in this case toughness, but that's something to discuss later as well. The last thing to write down from your homeworld is your wounds, which are going to be a set value plus 1d5, in our case 9 plus 1d5 because we're tough as shit. What exactly are wounds? Basically think of them as a wall. When you take damage from attacks or hazards, after damage reduction from your armor, assuming you have any, is calculated, the remainder is deducted from your wounds. 
Once they run out and your wall is shattered, you start taking much more serious damage, called critical damage depending on where and by what you were hit. Different locations and damage types will have different effects, so 5 points of critical damage to your leg by a bullet will hurt like hell and probably cripple you for a while, but it's better than 10 points of critical damage from an explosion to the head. The only thing after that is a small sampling of suggested backgrounds that would work best for a character from your chosen planet, but that shit's for nerds. As we go thumbing through the different background choices, it's important to remember that these are not your classes. While you do get several skills, talents, and pieces of equipment from this part of the character creation process, it is more to do with how you got roped into the Inquisition rather than what you do within it. But to cut to the chase, we'll make our little Am Prim a member of the Adeptus of Ministratum. I'm sure he's destined for great things as he burns his eyes out staring at 10,000 nearly identical legal documents for the rest of his life. Your background gives you a couple similar benefits as your homeworld, specifically a background bonus and an aptitude. This time you get to choose between one of two aptitude options, so we won't bother retreading that ground again. As for the other stuff, you get a series of skills that you know at a basic level, some weapons, training, and some basic equipment. I chose to give this character training in Laz weapons, so we'll jot down the equipment he's carrying in the gear section of the character sheet and write down Laz pistol in the weapon section. Finally, we get to the roles. This is what you could call your class in Dark Heresy, and it's how you'll be playing your character throughout their lifetime. Are you a hard-boiled seeker who never loses a target? Perhaps a bloodthirsty warrior who will do anything to state their killing urges? Or maybe a soft-spoken sage who never forgets a face and could do even the most complex equations in their head. If you're unsure of your choice, or just aren't certain how a character in any one role would play, the book provides both example characters for each role and some guidance at the bottom of each section for how you might want to build your character over the course of the game. Depending on your choice, you're given a series of aptitudes, a role talent, and one last role bonus that will let them use fate points to automatically succeed on certain skill roles. With their backstory and role ironed out, we can finally start talking about what aptitudes do. As a refresher, our sample character was born on a feral world so has a toughness aptitude from that, a social aptitude thanks to being part of the Adeptus Administratum, and because of the sage role he gets willpower, tech, intelligence, perception, and most important of all, knowledge. What are all these for? We'll basically use them for discounts. Unlike other RPGs, there's no real leveling system where reaching experience thresholds makes you stronger. Instead, you spend your gained XP from fighting and solving mysteries and such on different advances. Make your characteristics stronger, learn new skills or improve the ones you already know, or even purchase new talents. And depending on what aptitudes you have, if yours match the ones listed for a skill, talent, or characteristic, then you can get a pretty huge discount on the XP cost depending on whether one or two of them match up. For example, getting a single plus 5 increase in a characteristic costs 500 XP at base, 250 with one aptitude matching, and a measly 100 XP with two. Each newborn acolyte starts with a thousand XP to spend, so go nuts. The only thing left to do before the home stretch of character creation is equipping your acolyte. While you do start with several pieces of equipment already, this last step is basically the gear you brought from home on your adventures, and the amount of things you can take is based on your influence bonus. This is calculated based on the tens value of your characteristics, so if you have 34 influence you can choose 3 items, and they must be of scarce rarity value or better so you can't walk out of the armory with your hands in a brand new storm bolter. Oh, and FYI, anytime the book asks you for a characteristic bonus for calculation like this, it works the exact same way. Okay, this video is starting to get a little long, so let's wrap this up. The last step of character creation is ironing out all the kinks of your character. Their likes, dislikes, their appearance, things that you probably wrote down at the start, but this is a chance to go over the details one more time. To help with the process, ask yourself what they desire most. What would they be willing to do to obtain it? How warped are they willing to become? And for one final touch, you need to roll on the D100 divinations table as your mind is afflicted by the twists of fate and immediately apply the listed result. And ta-da! Your character is complete. One last thing to bring up is the elite advances. These are prestige classes that often radically shift the narrative and require a lot of time and effort to become. For example, to become an Inquisitor, an acolyte must have an influence characteristic of 75 and must be ordained by another Inquisitor to be granted the title. As this accomplishment will not only completely change the group dynamic but how the entire Imperium perceives this individual and the power they now hold. There are a decent number of these elite advances, and I'd say they're all worth looking into with your GM's guidance so you're not jumping into the role of a psyker completely unprepared and start shitting out warp magic. But hey, that'll about do it for this week, and I hope to see you all again next time.